this time of worship together with a live forever on the edge.
Good morning. Good morning. It is great to see you and to be with you on this Easter Sunday. Uh, if me do this for me, uh, we've still got some folks coming in. If you've got some space around you and you don't mind sitting closer to the person beside you, if you wouldn't mind scooting a little bit as folks still kind of trickle in, it'd be great to help out uh, them. And so a uh, couple things going on. Uh, obviously, uh, We've got donuts and stuff in the connector. We've got drinks, refreshments over there. Uh, outside, you can get at your uh, picture taken with your family around the cross. Uh, we'll take it on your phone. We'd love to be able to take it uh, on a camera and be able to send that to you just for your family to be able to keep that and have a little bit more professional photo with that. And so there's those opportunities. If you are this morning a guest, first of all, I'll just say, uh, thank you for choosing to worship with us at New Hope. Um, New Hope is family. And we, we try, it doesn't matter how large or small we get, we try to make sure that everyone feels as their family because the Bible reminds us often it doesn't matter if we're Greek or Jews. It doesn't matter if we're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if we're free or in bondage. But when we are brothers and sisters in Christ, we are all the same. And this morning, whether it's your first time here or you are a long-standing member, I hope this morning you'll enjoy worshiping with your brothers and sisters in Christ as we sing songs about a God who didn't stay dead, but rose again. Colossians chapter two tells us, says that you who were dead in your trespasses, that's all of us from the moment we were born, it says those of you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him forgiving us all of our trespasses, canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. This he set aside by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them. This morning, we have freedom because the debts of our sin have been canceled on the cross on a Friday and they were triumphant over on a Sunday when he rose from the grave. That's why we come and we celebrate. That's why we come and we worship. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much. God, we thank you for the cross. God, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that was poured out on the the altar that covered over our sins. God, we, we thank you that you sent your son to die, knowing the burdens of the sin that he had to take on on that Friday. Father God, if you, you sent him knowing what was gonna take place, God, you knew what was going to happen three days later. Father God, you knew that he wasn't going to stay dead. God, you, you knew that there was going to be a day where he walked out of the tomb and he rose again. God, you knew that Satan was going to be defeated. And on Friday, Satan thought that he had won victory. God, he, he thought that he had nailed the Son of God to the cross and he was going to be dead forever. He didn't, he didn't account for the power of the Holy Spirit that would raise Jesus from life and then walk out of the tomb that would defeat Satan, defeat the grave, defeat the sin that we have in our lives and that we would be able to walk in freedom and be able to have relationship and communion with the Father forever and ever. God, he didn't know that, but you knew that. So today, this morning, we worship you because of that. This morning, we sing songs to you because of that. This morning, we get a chance to praise your name because of the hope of a salvation that we have, that one day that this earthly life and all the things that happen in it, God, it crumbles away and it goes away and we get to be made alive and new in heaven with you. That's why we're here this morning. So Father, may you just use the Spirit to 
touch hearts and minds this morning. May, may you be a comfort, an encouragement, a lifter up, a conviction. But mostly, Father, may you make yourself known to every single person so that none may walk out not knowing where they would spend eternity if they were to perish. God, we love you. God, today we celebrate you, we worship you, and we praise you for who you are. And we pray. Amen.
God, we praise you this morning. God, that we serve a living and a resurrected Savior. God, I thank you this morning for the power of the gospel. God, I thank you for the presence of your spirit. God, I thank you for the truth of your word. God, that promises us eternal life found only in Christ. God, I thank you this morning that some 2,000 years ago, I thank you that you were the perfect spotless lamb that Pilate couldn't find fault in you. I thank you, God, that Herod couldn't stop you. I thank you, Lord, that the tomb could not hold you. I thank you for the resurrected Christ that we celebrate, worship, praise, live for today. God, bless us this morning. God, with your spirit, your living presence, in Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. 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 Be seated. Man, I'm glad you're here this morning. A little fuller than the first service. Y'all are here for the right one today, I'm confident. Amen? Amen. Glad that you were here. I noticed the line for the picture taken outside was a little overwhelming a while ago. So after the service, if you didn't get there, you can go back. I stepped outside this morning. If you remember in your Bibles, <clears throat> you'll remember uh, before the Lord Jesus was crucified, you remember that the Lord had promised Peter and prophesied in his life that before the rooster crowed, he would deny him, right? Three times, and he did. Well, when I walked outside this morning, I have a few chickens and a rooster. And uh, when I opened the door this morning, way, way before daylight coming up here, my rooster was crowing this morning. Can I just tell you all that? And it, I had to stop for a minute, right? I had to pause a minute. I've heard that rooster crow many times, but this morning it caught me, right? The timing was impeccable, and I thought, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. And I, my, my rooster now has a spiritual reason in my life. Amen? Amen? Because now when I hear him crow, I'm going to be reminded, I'm thankful that even though I knew and God knew I would sin against him, he went to the cross for me anyway. Amen? Amen. Mark chapter 16. This morning in your copy of the Word of God, I really want to try to help apply this morning uh, the power and the reason, the reality of the resurrection of Christ in your life. I know that most of you have gathered many times on Easter. I know that many of you have heard uh, the gospel story of the cross, that Jesus came, He was buried, uh, He rose again. I know you've heard that. But what does it really mean in your life? And what does it mean in my life? We moved this morning into the first few moments of that resurrection morning. We move and shift into what was taking place and the first that encountered uh, that empty tomb. I remind you this morning that the fact that the tomb is empty, it means hope for every situation you have in life. It means no matter what you struggle with, it means no matter what you battle with, it means there's hope in the gospel and hope in the living Lord. We sang just a moment ago, chains are falling, right? We sing words like that because the power of the tomb means that you and I, right, can be set free and we can move forward in life in the victory of the Lord Jesus. So Mark 16, we begin to see the miracle unfold. And I want to ask you this morning, I know, I know you got Easter lunch today and I know you got roast or ham in the oven. I don't know what, but you got plenty of time today. Amen. I promise to have you out of here by 3 or 4 p.m. Amen. <laughs> no, you're fortunate this morning. I'm back to back, right? So uh, there's another crowd coming. And uh, so you, you got home plenty of time. I'm asking you this morning to just immerse yourself for a minute into the emotions and the feelings and the happenings of that Easter morning and let God change your life with it. Look at your Bible this morning. I normally walk all the way through the passage, but I'm just going to forsake a time, take a verse at a time this morning, this story. Mark chapter 16, the Bible says, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went 
to the tombs. Let's just pause there just a minute because I want to camp out on this lady called Mary Magdalene. There's several Marys there. I guess in that day, everybody just named all their daughters Mary. I don't know, there's Mary, Mary, more Marys, right? Y'all ought to try that as moms and dads. Sometimes if you when if you're start to have children, just name them all the same thing. And when you get older, you just call one and they all come because you won't remember their name anybody. Can I get a testimony? You just walk through the list. You can save yourself a lot of trouble. Just call one name and everybody, whoever can hear, can come, right? But all the Marys are there. But I want to focus in on this lady named Mary Magdalene. She's mentioned 13 times in the gospel. She's mentioned more times than several of the disciples. She is a significant, faithful follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not have the story of when she met the Lord, but what we do know is the Bible says that Jesus cast out of her seven demons. And all I want you to hear from that is the number seven in the Word of God means a number of completion, and that means she was fully tormented, she was fully tortured, she was fully controlled by that which evil threw at her in the world. She had no life until until she met the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to see a picture of her life? There's another story in the Bible where somebody's completely controlled by demons. It's a Gadarean demoniac. And the Bible says that no clothes could stay on him. No chains could hold him. He runs all through the cemetery screaming at night. That's probably a pretty good picture of this lady before she met the Lord Jesus Christ. And he set her free. And after he set her free, she became a devoted follower of the Lord Jesus. And can I I just tell you, if you realize what the Lord has set you free from, you'd become a devoted follower of the Lord Jesus Christ too. Amen? Amen? He has set us free, right, from the penalty and the pain and the punishment for all of our sins. So we find her in this story. She is from a little fishing village called Magdala. Uh, Carissa and I were in Israel uh, last year, and the very first view you have of Galilee, I remember seeing, I, I, this doesn't sound right, but I'm in Mississippi, right? There's a big hollow that goes to the left. Y'all with me this morning? That doesn't sound right in some parts of the world, but there's a big valley goes to the left. That valley goes to Nazareth, and where it spills into, if you will, the Sea of Galilee, there is a little uh, recently excavated village of Magdala. That's where she's from, Mary Magdala. Magdalene. This lady has been set free, and she's a faithful follower of the Lord. And Scripture tells us that she's there at the cross of Calvary. Scripture tells us that here she is that first resurrection morning, the Sabbath is past, and she is going with the other ladies with their spices to anoint Jesus' body. You may have been here last week, you may have not, but last week we looked at the preceding text, which tells us that Joseph of Arimathea asked for permission and takes down the body of Jesus. He was a secret disciple of the Lord, but that day he came out of the closet. That day everybody knew he was a faithful follower of the Lord. He believed in him, and he along with a man named Nicodemus take the body of Jesus down, and the Bible says they had 75 pounds of spices. That's a lot of spices, right? It's part of the process of wrapping up a body of the Lord Jesus. They do that. I'm going to tell you what happened. Here's a man and woman thing. Are y'all ready this morning? Here's what I think happened. I think all these ladies were there at the tomb that day. All of them watched Joseph of Arimathea take him to the tomb, and can I just tell you, they watched these two guys wrapping the body of the Lord Jesus. And you know what those ladies say? Because y'all do this too. They said, those guys don't know what they're doing. <laughs> hmm? Amen? So, so one of them elbowed the other. This is horrible. But hey, as soon as we can, first light on the first day of the week, we're coming back to do it right. And they're back here. And look at what your Bible says. Mary Magdalene, start again. Mary Magdalene. Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early, on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went. You see it in your Bible? They went to the tomb. You and I read a story like this, and we kind of read right past that because we know the story of Easter, right? We know the story of Resurrection Weekend. And we know that in that moment, all hope is not lost because we believe in a risen Lord. Can I just camp you there for just a minute? This is a place that represents death. It's a place of horror. It's a place that carried with it all the pain of what they experienced that week. Three years ago, on April the 4th, just this week, we had Easter that Sunday. 
It was my first Easter in 32 years of my life without my wife that had served alongside me and I'd lived with and loved. 32 years, that was my first Easter. Can I tell you, graves have pain. Are y'all here this morning? You, you don't know that pain until you sprawled yourself out in a cemetery. My wife is buried 100 feet or so outside my office window. Until you sprawled yourself out in the cemetery in the middle of the night, you're just broken. I want you to recognize this morning the weight of Mary Magdalene that she carries to the tomb. The one that had brought her all the hope she'd ever experienced in life. The one that set her free from seven demons. He is now dead. And now what? I want you to feel the weight of the moment. I feel the hopelessness of the situation. And they went to the tomb. They were downcast. They were broken. There was weeping. And then as if it could not get any worse, look at your Bible, it suddenly does. Verse number 4. Verse number 3. Who will roll the stone for us? They remember that big stone that comes down in front of the entrance. It kind of slid down by gravity and a little shove, and it closed off the hole. There, the entrance to the tomb, it was probably sealed by the Roman guards, probably sealed with wax. Nobody could open it legally, but nobody could also open it physically. As if it could not get any worse, suddenly it does. They went to the tomb, but look at what the Bible says. See, we, we take it for granted what took place. Watch this. Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Verse number 4, and looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was a mega stone. It was a very large stone. What seemed like was a barrier in their life was automatically an invitation from God to come and see what only he could do. It was the invitation to experience something. It's interesting because all the gospel writers really focus on the fact that the stone was rolled away. And you wonder, why do I even need to know that detail? I mean, I, why can't I just know that, hey, the tomb is empty and that's good enough? The Bible specifically tells us the stone was rolled in place. And then that morning, the stone was rolled away. What does that mean in my life, and how do I deal with that? See, see, what you probably missed is something happened here. Matter of fact, in your Bible, there's a transition that begins to take place in those few verses. It is a movement into the resurrection of Christ. Something is happening that you and I don't even realize. I want you to see it. It's right there in your Bible because you, you probably missed it because I camped here a while this week and I missed it for a while. But I want you to look in your Bible right there. We got the, we got the, the dismay and the depression and the defeat. They're journeying to the tomb. They're probably not saying a word until somebody suddenly envisions what, when we get to the tomb. I can't even get in. I can't even do what I put on my heart to do today. I can't even do that. And now what are we going to do? And then the stone is rolled away. But you miss what happens in between. Look at your Bible, verse number 4. The Bible says, And they looked up, and they saw. Now, I've read that for many years, and I thought, okay, they would have been downcast, and they're walking towards the tomb, and suddenly you look up, and yeah, you see something you didn't see. It's so... There's so much more there than just lifting of the head. Let me see if I can help you this word. There's a word there in the original language that you don't catch reading in English, but it's kind of like this. We find the same word in Mark's gospel in Mark chapter 7. Jesus is about to do one of his many miracles. He's about to feed the 5,000. I pray you know the story right there. They're on the hillside, and he's got a Captain D. Kiss meal, right? He's got two fish and five pieces of bread, and he's about to do something miraculous with it. But watch this. Here's the word again, the same word used there. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus, here it is, he looked up to heaven and he blessed it and he gave thanks for it and then he broke it and multiplied it. Can I just tell you something happened in that moment that was way more than a lifting of the head. You find it in Mark chapter 10. You find a deaf man and a mute man. He can't speak right. He can't hear because he's never heard what language even hears like. And then Jesus looks up to heaven and his ears 
were open. There, there's another picture. Jesus looked up to heaven. You find a man named Blind Bartimaeus. You find him. He, he's never been able to see. Jesus is passing by. He's calling on him. He's almost pestering Jesus, if you will. And finally, Jesus cries out to him. He says back to him, what, what do you want? And Blind Bartimaeus says, I, here's the word again, I want to see. The word literally means they regain their sight. Watch this. And then they saw the stones rolled away. Can I tell you, sometimes you will get so burdened by barriers in your life that you can't even see what God is about to do in your life. I promise you, they had to clear the tears out of their eyes that day. They had to look more than physically look up. Something happened spiritually. And when they saw that stone roll back, something was happening in their heart. They had enough faith to move forward a little bit in life. Some of you this morning, you've got barriers in your life. You've got struggles in your life. You've got things that are hindering you from moving forward in faith. We've got many in our church with medical issues, medical problems, doctor's reports. Doctor's visits, cancer. Only God can change your perception and perspective about that. Only when you look up to God can God begin to speak into your heart and provide healing even in the midst of trouble. Some of you may have job difficulties. Brother Doug, if you knew where I worked, if you knew how bad it was, if you knew how hard it was, if you knew how I wanted to be somewhere else, maybe you just need to look up to heaven and ask God to change your perception about where you are. Maybe God's put you there to be salt. Maybe he's put you there to be light. Maybe he's put you there to make a difference. And when God's ready for you to go somewhere else, he'll open another door for you. Yes. Right? The stone is rolled away. Some of you might have marriage problems this morning. Oh, I've been pastoring long enough to know. <laughs> Brother Doug, if you knew how bad a shape we were in, if you knew how difficult it was, if you knew every day I get up dreading what's going on in my home, uh, we, can't, we can't deal with this barrier. No, no, you can't. But God can. Maybe you need to look up. And ask God to do something only He can do. Maybe you need to let Him change your heart towards one you live with and love. Barriers that prevent us from going. Can I remind you this morning that the Bible says that we were all dead in our trespasses and sins? You, you had a barrier between you and God the Father. He's a holy God. You were a sinner. You were born in sin and you have sinned. I promise you all of us have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. You had a barrier between you and a holy God. But guess what? On the cross of Calvary, Jesus took that boulder. He took that barrier. And if you've confessed Him as Lord of your life, He's cast that boulder into the sea of God's forgetfulness. Right? It's gone. Never to be brought up again. He's already removed the barrier that you need to get to a holy God. It happened on the cross of Calvary. We've had a memory verse this month. This Romans 10, 9. That if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart. Such a simple truth that God raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. That's one of the greatest promises in all the Bible. Amen. Amen. That's one of the greatest promises in all the Bible. Amen? Amen. That's what we celebrate today. It's not possible without Easter. It's impossible. So what do you do with a text like this? What do you do when you have a story like this? Look at the Bible, verse number 4. It says, looking up, they saw that stone had been rolled away and it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. Oh, yeah, you bet they were. And he said to them, do not be afraid or don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they have laid him. Looking up, they saw the tomb opened up. The stone rolled away. They had enough faith to walk in. And in that, they came to find the body of Jesus. Don't miss this. And they found nothing. And that nothing became everything for who we are as followers of Christ. That nothing became everything. 
walked in a garden tomb there in Israel, kind of stooped down. It's not very far from the place of the skull, not very far, a couple hundred yards probably from the place that Jesus was likely crucified. I don't know if it's Jesus' tomb or not. Nobody knows. It discovered in 1867, excavated, but I remember walking in the little hole, and you kind of walked in, you stood up, there's a little room, and you turn, and there's two burial plots right there. Guess what? There was nothing there. Can I just tell you that? It was no different than they found that morning. Nothing was there. Everything that we are and everything we celebrate and praise God for today is the fact that they found nothing, yes. nobody, that Easter morning. Everything that we are. Not, nothing. With, here's the place where they laid him. So what do I do with this? When I look up, here it is, you ready? When I look up, I need to realize that impossibilities can become opportunities to experience God's power. When I look up, I connect with that which is only God. And when I do that, what appears to be impossible to mankind, right, is always possible with God. I connect to that which is not of mankind, but that which is only of God. The rolling of the stone away wasn't so Jesus could get out. You know that story. But it's an invitation for all of us to come in and experience the victorious Christian life that's only found in the empty tomb. I want you to recognize that impossibilities in your your life, bears in your life. They're there, and you say, I can't move forward, Brother Doug. But guess what? God wants you to grow in faith and to move forward in that and to experience something you never experienced before. Impossibilities are opportunities to experience God's power in your life. I don't know what your barrier is. I don't know what your burden is, but I'm just telling you, he defeated the greatest thing you'll ever face, and that's called death. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? But thank Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Impossibilities are opportunities for God to demonstrate his power in your life. Number two, this morning, we move. When we look up, when we look up, we move from the explainable and the expected in your life. And you move into the realm of the spiritual and that which is supernatural. Can I tell you, church, this morning, I've lived long enough. I've lived long enough and realized the brevity of this life. I do not want to live any day of my life. I struggle with this, and some days I don't, but I don't want to live any day of my life where everything that happens is ordained by me and is expected and explainable. I don't want to live there. That's boring. It's boring. If all I'm enjoying is that which I have done... I don't want to live there. I want to live in that which only God can do. I want to live in that which is spiritual and that which is supernatural to where when I go to bed at night, I said, man, God, you showed up and showed out today. I don't even know how all that happened, but it happened, and I just got to be part of it. Here's what I know. When you look at the life of the disciples, they never got up when they followed Jesus, and they never again got up and said, boy, this is just going to be an ordinary day. You won't find that in the Bible. They got up every morning. They looked at one, and they said, boy, wonder what's going to happen today. What is he going to do today? Nobody got up one morning and said, somebody is going to walk on water today. Nobody got up one morning and said, Jesus is going to speak, be still, peace, be still, and the waters of the Sea of Galilee are going to be calm as a meal pond. Nobody expected that to happen. Nobody expected crippled men to be healed and to walk again. Nobody got up any day and expected the mundane and the ordinary and the explainable. Matter of fact, every day when they walked with Jesus, Jesus, they said, boy, this is no, no, nothing, something's going to happen today we have never, ever, ever seen before. I want to walk in that kind of life. Why would I not? You want some adventure? Follow Jesus a little while. I, I want to move into that. What happened for them is that day the stone was rolled away, and in that moment they walked into another realm that was not accessible except by recognizing, looking up, God's done something, and walking into that and experiencing something all completely new. And finding nothing, they found everything. But here's the last thing this morning. You and I must choose. We've got to make a choice. Am I going to live by faith? And am I going to walk by faith? 
or I'm going to walk by sight. There's many of you in here this morning, you've never trusted Jesus as Christ as Lord of your life. You've been to church, maybe grew up in church all your life. There comes a point in time you've got to walk by faith. There comes a point in time when you recognize God is inviting me to something deeper. God is inviting me to something closer. God is inviting me to be forgiven. God is inviting me to be saved. And there comes a point. I don't understand all this, but I've got to walk by faith in it. Let me ask you this morning, where, where, is, where is the source of authority in your life? I hope it's not social media. Everything on there is true, right? Right? No. I hope it's not the news. That's not a source of authority. I hope it's not your best friend, your neighbor. But there is an authority. And called the Word of God. Amen. It's unchanging. It's never changed. Inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. And it says that every one of us are all sinners. Every one of us. There's no one righteous, not even one. I don't know about you, but that doesn't leave any room for you or I. There's no one righteous, not even one. Right? And the wages of my sin is death. That's what God's Word says. That's what the authority says is death. I deserve death, not just physical death. I deserve eternal separation from my holy God. That's what I deserve. But God gives a gift. He offers a gift. And that gift is eternal life found only in Christ. That's the story of Easter. Well, why would I go all the way through my life just in celebrating Easter and its colored eggs and bunny rabbits? Nothing wrong with that. It's a fun thing for kids to do. But the story of Easter is the cross. I tell you, you can decide where you are in your walk with Christ. You can decide right now. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, it says the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing. And by the way, the message of the cross includes the fact that I'm a sinner. It means that I need a Savior. I needed somebody to die in my place. I needed His blood to be forgiven. I needed that. And He was buried and He rose again and He lives forever. That's the message of the cross. That's the message of this weekend. And that message is foolishness to those who are perishing. What's that mean? I'm, that means I'm on a journey to a place called hell if I'm perishing. I'm eternally separated from God. The, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But for those who are being saved, do y'all know I love the butts in the Bible, amen? I love those butts where God takes an impossibility and God does something that only God can do and he turns it right side up. But, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. The Bible tells me that that same power that raised Jesus from the dead that resurrection morning is the same power at work in my life. So I have to ask you, do you sense and feel the power? power of God working in your life. I don't mean just believing there is a God. The devil believes there's a God. I mean, I have recognized that I need forgiveness and I need salvation. I need to know the one that we just sang about that said Jesus saves. I need to know him and I need to experience that and I need to walk in it. That's the power of this weekend. They walked in that. And I got to walk by faith and recognize I don't understand everything, but I got to move forward. The tomb was open. They walked in. But watch what happened there in your Bible. Look what happened. The Bible says in verse number six, and he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. And there you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized him. By the way, that's not faith yet. That's fear. Fear and faith don't go together. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Can I tell you, there's a lot of people that profess to be followers of Christ who never say a word about their testimony or never witness for Christ. Do you know why? Because they're right there. They said nothing. They, they saw it. They saw the empty tomb, but they had never moved into a life of faith and never been regenerated and born again yet. They didn't believe that Jesus was alive. They're walking in fear. Look at the story. It gives us a summary if you look on in your Bible. Verse number 9. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out 
seven demons. Here's a summary of the story. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard the disciples, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. You know what had to happen? Every one of them had to encounter the resurrected Christ to believe. Can I tell you, I haven't seen him physically, but oh, I've sensed him spiritually. Oh, I've sensed his presence in my life. I know that the Lord Jesus is alive, and I have the presence of his Holy Spirit in my life. That's what happens when I get saved. If that's foolishness to you, you're perishing. That's what the Bible says. But to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. I told you that every one of us are in this story. Every one of us. Where am I, Brother Doug? I want, I want to help you see. There are times in your life that you are mourning and you're broken. Times when you're defeated, depressed, and you can't go any further. You say, I just can't handle any more boulders in life. I can't handle anything else in life. I don't know how. Can I just tell you this morning, why don't you just look up? Why don't you just look up? Let God change where you are. You may say, Brother Doug, I, I, I'm so lost. I'm so far in sin. God could forgive me. Oh, yes, he can. Don't you let the devil tell you that lie. Don't you? There's nobody so good they don't have to be saved, and nobody so bad they don't need to be saved and can't be saved. Know that this morning. You might be right there. I just don't know how to move forward. You might be the one that's looking in the tomb. You see the stone rolled away. You say, I've heard this message. I've gathered on Easter. I've heard this story. Jesus died and he buried and he rose again. But I've never really explored what that means that Jesus is alive. That might be you this morning. Man, wouldn't it be sad to go all the way through this life and never find the one who gives life? Never find that in fullness. You might be there. You might be somebody, I believe in God. I've had difficulties in my life. And hey, I've sought God. I've I prayed. I've seen people do this. I prayed and I prayed. But guess what? They just believe in a God and believe in God. They've never trusted in Jesus. Never recognized they need forgiveness. Never recognized you need to be born again, the Bible says. That's the story of Easter. It's not some once a year thing. And when God sets you free, you, you are devoted to Him. Can I just tell you that? There's a devotion. How much does God love you? Look at the cross. No matter where you are in life, how much does God love you? Look at the cross. But God demonstrated His love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how much God loves you. But guess what? There's a barrier between you and Him. He's already taken care of it on the cross of Calvary. All I must do is confess it. All I must do is believe it. And in that, I can be changed. That's the story of the gospel. There might be a few of you in there this morning that fall into that last bracket. You done walked in the tomb. You done realize, hey, Jesus is not there. You realize, hey, he really is alive. I am walking in the fullness of the living Lord. Every morning when I get up, there is fruit in my life. I recognize God is going to do something supernatural, and God's going to do something only God can do today, and I cannot wait to walk in it. I cannot wait to experience it, but I've been pastoring long enough. We don't stay there very long. And we drift right back and we're shackled with something else. We got another hindrance. Can I just tell you, I don't know where you are this morning in your walk, but God's inviting you. The message of the empty tomb is God inviting you. Come on, I want to show you something. I want you to experience something. I want you to experience something way beyond what this world has to offer. It's the empty tomb. And where you find nothing, where Jesus is not found, becomes everything for you in life. I can tell you, you'll come to a place in life where this life you live seems hopeless. And you have to look up and you find hope. And it's found only in Christ. It's only in Him. I had one of our deacons this morning, talked to him a little while, had a, a horrific week. He said, boy, I've just sat and recognized I'm thankful the Lord alive. I'm thankful He's the source of my hope. You'll find yourself there. Do you know him? Do you trust him? Do you believe him? Have you been saved by him? Stand with me this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed.
I wonder this morning if every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around but me. I wonder if somebody would just say this morning, Brother Doug, I, and I just want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you. I just want to pray for you. I wonder if somebody, nobody looking, nobody but me. I wonder if somebody say this morning, Brother Doug, I just, I feel like I'm kind of at the end of a road. I feel like life has turned dark. I feel like there's a struggle every day. I feel like there are barriers in front of me moving forward in faith. I don't even know what that looks like, but I just feel defeated. I feel broken. Nobody's looking. Will you just slip your hand up this morning so I can pray for you? Come on, be, be courageous, be faithful. Some over there in the wing, some in the front. Be, you say, I just got the end of myself this morning. I'm hurting. I'm struggling. You can get, guess what? Lifting your hand just acknowledges, hey, I need to look up. Will you just do that? I'm watching. I'm going to pray for you just a minute. Men and women all over the room, put your hands down. I wonder if you say this morning, Brother, I know I'm a believer. I know that. I know I've trusted in Christ, but I know also in my life, I'm not living in fullness. I know the truth of the cross. I know the truth of the tomb. I, I've read all that, and I've believed all that, but I don't feel the power of God in my life today, and I want to. I desire it. Will you just slip your hand up? I want to pray for you. I just want to feel God's power in my life and afresh. All over the room. That's your admittance. That's your confession. God, I need you. I need something fresh in my life. Put your hands down. Now, I wonder if there's anybody in here this morning. And brother, I have heard this message this morning. I've realized I've kind of scoffed at this message before. I've kind of heard it and walked away from it. I've never really known how to truly place my faith in the cross or in the fact that Jesus is alive. I've never truly been saved. And today, on Easter Sunday, the last day of March 2024, I'd like to know that my sins are forgiven. I'd like to be washed and cleansed and made anew. And I'd like to experience life found only in Christ. And Brother Doug, today, I'd like to know that I'm saved. Will you just lift your hand up? I want to know I'm saved this morning. Anybody? All around the building. Several. Anybody else? I want to be saved today. Amen. I want to know that. Put your hands down. So in just a minute, we've got an invitation time. If you've said this morning, Brother Doug, I'm just at the end of the road. I, I want newness. I want freshness. I want a new realization of the life of Christ. I realize I'm not where I want to be. I'm certainly not where I can be. But as a believer, you just want to press in this morning. This altar is a place you meet with God. It's a place He meets with you. See, everybody that looked in the tomb, that hole was small. He had to bend down to get in. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he might lift you up. The path up with God is always down to realize God's doing something in your life. This altar's here. It's a place you meet with the Lord. There's people all around who would love to pray with you, just lay a hand on you. In just a minute, we're going to sing. It's your time. Easter Sunday. Let me ask you a question. Is the price Jesus paid for your sins on the cross... Is the life that you live, is it worth it for him? Does he see a harvest out of that which he's done in your life? And all of us, I promise, could do better. We honor him today by presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. This is our act of worship. <laughs> The altar's here this morning. And any of you this morning that lifted your hand up just a moment ago and said, I, I would like to be saved today. I'd like to have my sins forgiven. If you'll just step out in courage in just a minute, boldness, and come down and say, Brother Doug, I want to be saved today. i got men and women right here can walk you in the hall and share with you the gospel message of how to be saved. Man, what, what a day to experience Christ on Easter 2024. There's people all around the building praying for you, interceding on your behalf. 
Just slip out. Come here and say, Brother, I want to be saved. I want to know what that is. Father, I ask in this moment, oh God, I ask that you would draw us close. I ask in this moment, God, that we could experience, God, the supernatural power of the Lord Jesus. God, I pray your Holy Spirit, God, would have freedom, God, in every heart, in every mind. God, I pray for these who have just openly lifted their hand that I'm struggling today. Life is dark. God, I pray that you, the light of the world, God, would shine in their heart and life today. Give them hope found only in Christ. God, I'm certain there's many more that didn't lift a hand up. That wish life was different, hoped it was different, but they can't find a way forward. God, today, will you illuminate the path and say, come on, I want to show you something. God, may they hear that call in their life to draw near while you may be found. God, we love you. We thank you that you are a God who loves us and desires a relationship and a conversation with us. God, may we honor you today just by doing so in our life. In the mighty and matchless and living name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Altar's here this morning. I'm here. You take time. Worship. Pray. Honor the Lord. Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful?
beautiful day God has given us. Celebrate it. Celebrate what he's doing in your life, what he has done, and what he is doing. Amen? Give him glory in that. Be blessed. Go out there and get your picture taken. I guess they don't know still out there. I don't know, right? Go help yourself. The main thing, just worship the Lord today in your heart. God bless you. Jeff's going to lead us in a song. You can ease out as we sing if you want to. Go ahead, Jeff. Mm -hmm. 